We've been in a series called Family Matters for a while now, and we'll finish up this series on uh, Father's Day. Several special things on Father's Day, uh, Parent-Child Commitment Day, and uh, these, these next several Sundays have lots of fun and exciting things to be a part of. We've talked, uh, Jimmy Smith and I, as we developed the series, we, we determined early on we would spend more time on marriage than any other topic we talked about. And we were really serious about why that needed to be because marriages are under attack, I think, as never before because God's, God's vision for what marriage is supposed to be uh, has been uh, minimized by our culture that the gospel itself being wrapped up in the definition of marriage and God's words, a big deal. And so we spent more time on marriage than anything else. And uh, we're going to do it one more time today. But this message today, while uh, it's about marriage, one of the things that uh, I want to tell you on the front end of things is that everything that I say today about marriage and having a great marriage will also result in a great friendship. It'll result in great work relationships. It'll result in great relationships with your extended family. These are principles for how to have a great relationship. My applications are going to be toward marriage for the most part, but uh, you can apply in a lot of different ways. I have a picture for you. This very young couple are lighting a unity candle, a symbol of uh, two becoming one, coming from two families and forming their own family. So, in December of 1985, Rhonda Blanton and Chad Self are standing right there. And they are lighting a unity candle together. They are two different people. They have no idea how different they are at this point, by the way. (laughs) But here they are at the marriage altar, and it's a beautiful scene. So elegant, so formal. Planned and prepared hours and hours and hours have gone into just this this one hour at First Baptist Church in Beeville, Texas. And uh, it just didn't fit with the picture right to, uh, to put thought bubbles above their heads, but I'd like to do that. On the left, in that beautiful white dress, is my beautiful bride, Rhonda. And she's thinking about all the guests filling up that church that day, who are thinking about how beautiful she is in that beautiful wedding dress. Now, that guy on the right, he's also thinking. He's thinking, how do they make these, we- these rented wedding shoes so shiny? <laughs> so that's what he's thinking. She's concerned because on the unity candle, there's a song that's supposed to pop. And it was slow coming in. And she's thinking about that. Why, why was that slow? Now, that guy, he's thinking the game is probably at halftime right now. But I'm not going to be able to get the score until this is over. That's, that's what he's thinking. See, she's, she's there in this beautiful situation. She's, she's thinking about that unity candle thing. She planned it out. We practiced a lot the night before, but she's thinking, we need to get those candles, and they need... They need to come together at the unity candle at the exact same time. Now that guy up there, he's thinking, I wonder how big the flame would be if I really cranked up this lighter all the way. So, two different people. (laughs) For most couples, there's a great deal of uh, time and energy and money spent on getting married. Everything that goes into an hour one day. But there's a lot less time, typically, that's spent on how to be married. Building a foundation that's going to last for a lifetime together. A lot of couples minimize that side of the, that side of the equation. And that's why so many marriages uh, do not go well. And uh, so many more uh, do not end well. Marriage is not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't happen just because you get together in front of witnesses and uh, friends, family, and, and go through a ceremony together. It, it takes a lot of work. And there, there are adjustments and there are compromises and there are changes that come. And not just, oh, that first year of marriage, and then you all have it figured out. A lot of you have been married a long time. We've been married now 30 and a half years. Uh, it, it's all along the way. And you keep having to work on it because 
amazingly, uh, divorces are occurring much more often at the 20, 30, 40, 50 year mark uh, of marriage. You have to keep working. Now, I read a story on their 50th wedding anniversary during a celebration, a big uh, dinner. The couple, the husband in the couple is Tom, and Tom was asked by his friends, so, so give, a, give an account of the benefits of marriage, of uh, this 50 years. Tom, tell us, what have you learned from all these wonderful years, 50 years of marriage with your wife? And Tom said, well, I've learned that marriage is the best teacher of all. It teaches you loyalty, uh, gentleness, forbearance, self-restraint, forgiveness, and a host of other qualities you'd never even have to try at if you weren't married. So, there you go. Men and women are different people. I heard a man once in a conversation with a group of men who claimed, he said, oh, I have women all figured out. And, and that really meant something to me in my relationship to that man. You could never trust that man. If he'll lie about that, he'll lie about anything. <laughs> now, uh, several years ago, uh, Danny Aiken, he was describing, uh, he's a seminary professor, describing the differences between men and women. And there are different ways, you know, that we've done that over years to describe the difference between men and women. But uh, for my sake, and I'm editing out half of this uh, because it would be too painful for you. And he, he said, really, men are like dogs and women are like, oh, they're like cats. You're exactly right. They're like cats. So this plays into my uh, sweet spot of ministry. <laughs> so here's, here's the first part. Now you can look at this. Is it a cat? Is it a woman? Or is it both? Number one, they usually do what they want. Now just track with me. This is Danny Aiken. This is not me. <laughs> Number two, they rarely listen to you. Number three, they're totally unpredictable. Number four, when they're not happy, they whine. Number five, when you don't want to play, they want to be alone. Number six, when you want to be alone, they want to play. Number seven, they want you to cater to their every whim. Number eight, they're moody. Number nine, they can drive you nuts and cost you an arm and a leg. And number ten, they leave their hair everywhere. <laughs> That's, he's a theology professor, so this is just a theological statement. Okay. What about, a, what about a man and a dog? Well, here we go. Or it could be both. Number one, they lie around all day sprawled out on the most comfortable piece of furniture in the house. Number two, they can hear a package of food opening a half block away, <laughs> but they can't hear you when you're in the same room with them. They leave their toys everywhere. They growl when they're not happy. When, when you want to play, they want to play. When you want to be alone, they still want to play. Number seven, they're great at begging. Number eight, they'll love you forever if you'll just feed them. Number nine, they do disgusting things and put disgusting things in their mouth, and then they try to give you a kiss. And number 10, they can look dumb and lovable all at the same time. So, hmm. Uh, I heard a guy once, he said that, uh, you know, we, when couples, uh, there's, this, there's this box right here. Uh, mar marked off on the platform and when couples get married here they stand just inside the box toes against that line and so that's that's how we usually set up when we're uh, doing a wedding in here and, and uh, one guy said that when uh, when a bride comes walking down the aisle she sees three things you know she sees she sees the aisle and she sees the altar and, and she sees him standing there and for the rest of their lives, that is her motto. I'll alter him. Uh, I, that's, uh, I'm, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate you going with me. Take your time as long as it takes you to get there. Uh, I'll wait. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that was hard on her, so here's hard on him. One husband, uh, during a time of difficulty with his wife in relationship to them, he said to her, when I am dead, you will find it hard to ever find another husband like me. I'll tell you that right now. And she said, oh, sweetheart, what makes you ever think I'd want to find another husband like you? 
Uh, so, there we go. Okay, uh, from, a, from a technical standpoint, there, this, this is uh, scientific. The difference between men and women. Okay, don't take too long to think about that. Just, but that is the difference between men and women right there. Okay, we can move that slide now, uh, Jimmy. Thank you. Okay, most, most marriages struggle because they're dealing with problems. And the relationship, uh, their relationship is just one conflict after another. And, and, and most married people and those thinking about getting married think that marriage just happens. Like, well, we're living in the same house. We're going through life together, so marriage is going to be fine. But, but what divorce just happens. Uh, marriage takes a whole lot of work. And, and here's how I like to approach this topic. Instead of talking about Sometimes in, in marriage things, we wait until there's a crisis and say, how am I going to dig out of the hole that I've created or the hole that we have created together? Instead, we're going to talk about how to build a great marriage. And, and the Bible speaks well to the subject today and will give us a good focus for great marriages, great friendships, great work relationships, uh, great family. So here we go. This is from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And here's what uh, Peter writes. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We'll come back and talk about that. Finally, in the same line of thought, finally, all of you, Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, let's start breaking this down. We have several things. You have a long outline today, which is my gift to you obsessive people uh, who enjoy such. Here's the first one. And also, you know almost what I'm going to finish, so you can start packing up your stuff early. That's why we give you an outline. Here's the number one. Great marriages listen. And I'm drawing that out of verse 7. Understanding, consider it. Great marriages are always going to listen. Listening opens doors to somebody else's life. It's how you get to know another person. And most of us are all about selling ourselves. Selling our agenda. Trying to convince other people, this is how you should do it. This is what is important. And listening says, I want to find out what's going on in somebody else's life. And we're really terrible at this as a general rule. Uh, And especially, it seems like in marriage. So a key to a great marriage, be considerate to be interested in what's going on in your husband's life, your wife's life. And this is one of those spots where you say, well, I don't care what you do at work. I, I don't know any of those people. I don't know, I don't understand what you do, so why am I having to listen to this? Because you care about them, because it's your spouse uh, here's what I, well, you, what you did all day is as important as what I did all day, or as stressful or as difficult. No, it's, you, when you care about them, you listen to their story. And this is one of those spots where I so appreciated my mother, who would, who would, uh, at the, the, my sister and I, mom and dad, at a dinner table in Victoria, Texas, she would, she would ask my dad questions about his work. And dad worked as a, at a chemical plant in Sea Drift, Texas. And he worked on pumps and compressors, and, uh, and mom would just, he would tell the details of technical stuff that, I think, mom, are you really, I, I remember in elementary school even, just looking at her thinking, is she really that interested in this? Dad would give all this detail, and she would just pull out more information. Well, how does that work? What is that? What does that mean? But she did that because she loved my dad, and she just wanted to pull that out of him and hear from him, and it added such value to their relationship for her to be that kind of listener, even when it wasn't, it wasn't her thing. Nobody is a born listener. None of us are good at this on, on the front side. 
uh, in any relationship, you know, talk to a three-month-old and say, you need to listen to what I'm telling you. You need to pay attention. Well, that three-month-old is uh, pretty self-absorbed at three months, and they're not going to listen to much of what you say as a parent uh, to them. But really, that's probably okay because they're three months old. But if you're old enough to get married, you should be a lot better at it than that. You shouldn't be quite so self-absorbed. And your story and your stuff, you have to learn to listen and you have to learn to love. Sometimes we stereotype and we say, well, men and women are different on this. That uh, women are, and, and often, women are, are more verbal. Uh, they have more words to share during the course of a day. Men, they're out of all their words by the time they get home at the end of a day, maybe. And sometimes, though, it'll be the wife that'll be the, the non-talker. And, and uh, you have to draw it out. One of you has to work harder at talking, expressing themselves. And, and, and here's what's going on with me. Here's what's important to me. Here's where my struggles are. You have to share that. And guys, we're really bad at that. So you need to be better at it. Wife, you need to help to draw it out in grace-filled ways. And you need to balance talking and listening. But when somebody's talking, somebody also has to be, has to be listening. And you can miss so much if this is out of the picture. Now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, throw out a spoiler alert to you right now because I'm about to give away something in a movie. So if you haven't seen E.T. since it was released in 1982, uh, brace yourselves. But I heard about a father who took his little daughter to see E.T. when it first came out. And there's a scene where it appears E.T. has expired. And it's a real, very moving scene. And uh, the father looked down at his daughter, and she was kind of sniffling, and she was all teared up. And he said, sweetie, are you sad that, that E.T. died? And she said, no, my foot's caught in the seat. Uh, and I just say that to say, you don't know what's going on with your spouse until you listen, until you draw some things out. Until you spend time together, you may be completely way off board with, with what's really happening. So, so take the time to listen. Here's the second thing. Great marriages overlook. And uh, key words in verse 9, uh, evil for evil. When, when you love, you overlook. That doesn't mean that you overlook everything. There are plenty of things that are big deals that need to be addressed. You, you can't just bury problems. You need to deal with problems in a relationship. But... There are a lot of things that really aren't a big deal. You, you, can't, you can't constantly look to make it even or get even with, with other people. And, and we can get into that mode where uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you know, you've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And then he says, but that's not how my followers do it. That's not how my disciples do it. It's not, I'm going to, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. But as we get, as we get older, you know, that's, again, a couple of four-year-olds fighting over a toy may go at it that way, but people who are old enough to be married probably should be better at it than that. And uh, couples erupt in conflict regularly over trivial things. And if there's big something that's out there in the relationship... The trivial things just keep feeding the fire of that, keep stoking the, the, uh, the, the temperature in, in the relationship to ridiculous levels. But so many things that, that stir us up in, in marriage are simple, simple things that, that shouldn't be a big deal. How many of you, and I don't want to ask for a show of hands on this one, uh, it, it hits everybody, I think, in, in a marriage relationship. How many of you in a marriage relationship, you've had that moment where you're telling someone else a story and you're together and you're telling someone else a story and the say the husband says yeah you know we're leaving the house about 2 30 and uh going to and she goes no 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 it was three o'clock have you ever done that argument i think it's closer to three o'clock no i think it's closer to 2 30 because I looked at, I looked at the, on the dashboard of the car, we climbed to the car, I looked, it said 2.30. And she says, no, because I'd just taken a call from my mother just before, and we were talking about it was closer to 3 o'clock. And, you know, if you're the person observing this, you just kind of back away, like, whatever's about to happen. I don't want to be in the line of fire, because it's getting hot. And you're, you're, you're escalating over something that really just doesn't make a hill of beans a difference in the world. But those things can, 
can become such a big deal. Uh, and that's time wasted in a conflict that didn't need to be. And you need to learn to overlook a lot of small stuff and, and not, not be constantly uh, protecting your territory, but learn to overlook the small things. You are two different people. One, one of the things I, I figured out early on in my life is that, you know, I'm glad that Rhonda had the grace in her life to marry me. I also recognize I personally would not have done it. I, I know me too well. And I, I wouldn't have married me. I don't want Rhonda to be me. I want her to be her. I, 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 that's why I married her, because she's different than me. And it's okay to be two different people. And sometimes you're going to see the world differently. And that's okay. You have to learn to overlook. You have to learn to let some things go. Everything can't be a trigger. Number three, great marriages value. Uh, verse seven, you know, showing honor and respect. When you value someone, you give them your, their true worth. You, you, say, you, you are precious to me. Uh, I, I heard him tell this story years ago, W.A. Criswell, legendary pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas. And we have people in our church that were married by Dr. Criswell. And uh, in, uh, in his talk, he said that from time to time, he does a wedding and the groom says, now, what do I owe you for doing this wedding? And uh, his classic response was always, just give me whatever she's worth. And he made a fortune doing weddings. Um, I did hear a story once he told that he just give me what she's worth. And boy, he dug deep and he gave, he gave almost all of it. He looked at the bride and uh, he gave it, most of it back to him. So that's just a legend of W.A. Criswell. But on that wedding day, the bride and groom value each other. And here's the thing about marriage. You can't let that fade after the wedding day. You still have to keep adding that value and, and celebrating that value. The rest of the world is going to knock you down, both of you. And make your marriage the one place where you're going to get built up. How do we show our spouse they're valuable? By how we treat them and by how we treat them consistently. You can't say, you're valuable. Well, it's your birthday. Uh, it's uh, Christmas, so I'm going, or Valentine's Day. I'm going all in on these days, but the rest of the time, you're pretty much on your own. Well, that's not what it's talking about. It says all the time, every day, you, you celebrate their value. Uh, I uh, only once have uh, flown first class on an airplane, and that was because I was dying. Uh, coming back from a mission trip and really thought I was just going to die. So I didn't get to enjoy it at all. Uh, there was a guy, same story, never ridden first class on an airplane. And he, uh, he got bumped up and he's pretty excited about it. It's a long flight too, so it's a great time to be flying first class. And partway through the flight, he, the flight attendant came by and the guy's just, just tears rolling down his cheeks. And he said, sir, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. It's just, I feel a little nostalgic. Sitting up here reminds me of what it was like when I first got married. But it's not like that anymore. Well, sometimes it shouldn't fade so severely after we've been married for a while. Are you treating your spouse as a first-class person? Are you treating them as extra baggage on your life journey? Fourth, great marriage, marriages encourage Blessing, love. In order to be encouraged, your spouse, and again, your friend, your extended family, your work, uh, so need to know that you love them, and they know, they only know that when you express it. Uh, and I've, I've, heard, I've heard those stories sometimes, and guys tend to be more inclined this way, that the wife says, you know, you never tell me you love me. And he says, well, I told you I loved you the day we got married. And if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Or I, I you know, I, I love you. I bring a paycheck home every week. And, you know, she says, I love you. I pay the bills and take care of the house and uh, bring it home my paycheck too. Uh, well, 
the answer, first of all, is your spouse should never have to say, do you love me? That ought to be expressed. It ought to be demonstrated. And it ought to happen over and over and over in a consistent kind of way. And the Bible says we should all encourage one another. But nowhere is that more true in marriage. The world's going to beat you down. The, the marriage ought to be a relationship of encouragement. Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, First Thessalonians says. A fifth thing is that great marriages dream. See good days. I love that. That uh, whoever desires to love life and see good days. Peter wrote, now, it's not guaranteed just because you got up this morning and a few years back you said, uh, I do, that it's going to be a great marriage. It's going to be a, a great day. But a great marriage happens because you set out that that is your goal. Uh, you want a great marriage and you make it your goal every day. And it's not just, well, 1985 in December, I said I do. Uh, but every day it's a recommitment to that vision that we had for our marriage when we began. I still do. I still do in relationship to all those vows, in relationship to all those things. How do you reach that goal? There are things I have written down over time that uh, when, when Ron, I'm watching TV and Ron is not much of a TV watcher. and it's all, It all happens in the same area of our house, though. And she comes in and starts talking to me. Uh, our marriage got so much better and we got a TV that you could pause and then pick up where it left off. And, and so I'll pause and I'll, I want to listen to what she says. I want to look her in the eye. I want to hear, what, hear what's going on with her. And then I'll, I'll pick up again. Uh, but it's important to, to spend time talking every day and sometimes we don't spend time talking uh, to have a date night uh, Rhonda and I started that years ago and when the kids especially when the kids were young and it's so labor intensive and we'd, we we worked it out with another couple that they take care of our kids sometimes we take care of their kids sometimes so that we could have a, a date night overnight date night uh, and and uh, Rhonda and I got a book, and I still have it's on my shelf in my, my office over here. It says uh, that the title of the book is uh, Now We're Alone, So What Do We Talk About? Is the title of the book. And it's just full of questions to make sure you're talking about something more than the kids and the bills and the house and the yard and what needs to be fixed. And, but you're talking about your heart, you're talking about life, and uh, it's a good, it was a good tool for us. You know, I. I made a commitment when we got married that every year I'd read at least one book related just to my marriage, how to get better at marriage. And I've kept that commitment for these 30 years of reading my book on marriage every year. Uh, go to a conference, go to some marriage enrichment event every year to keep building and growing the marriage. Dream big dreams for your marriage. You know, don't settle. I think way too many people settle for, uh, well, I had few years there, wedded bliss on the front end, another several decades of quiet desperation. Well, God just has a better plan for your marriage than that. And it ought to be beautiful. And it, you know what God's vision for your marriage is? You think, well, I want my marriage to be good. You know, I want us to get along. I want us to stick together. I want us to hit those markers. You know, 30, you know we've hit 30, you know, 40, 50, 60. We, we want to, but, but here's God's vision for marriage. And this from Ephesians 5. He talks about, uh, Paul says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, uh, or any such things, that he might be she might be holy and without blemish. God's vision for marriage is that every marriage of a husband and a wife, committed to one another and committed to Christ, that that marriage is to be a living, walking around uh, the community, living testimony 
of this is what the relationship between Christ and his church is. That's God's vision for marriage. We're, we tend to think of it way too, well, it's about me and me being happy and life being fun and everything always working out the way I think it should. God says, no, your marriage is about the gospel itself. And when, 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 you, when you start, when, when you stop trying and stop working and stop pushing forward and uh, get lazy with marriage or drop the ball on some things in marriage, it messes with the gospel itself. And this is why we've, we've said this before. We said if you, when, when our Supreme Court changed the definition of marriage, then uh, the reason it's a, there are multiple things, in, you know, multiple scriptures I can point to, but the big one is Ephesians 5 for me because they're changing the, what the gospel is. And you can't change the gospel. And that's why I dug in to fight, uh, fight that topic and, and declare it uh, through the life of our church. Because the gospel is tied to the definition of marriage. You value marriage and you fight for it. And you fight for the marriages around you. Number six, great marriages are honest. He talks in verse 10 about deceitful speech. Dishonesty will destroy you and it will destroy your marriage. Trust broken is hard to rebuild. This is one of those things where you need to be where you say you're going to be. You need to be doing what you say you're going to be doing. You get home when you say you're going to be home. Don't keep secrets from one another. Live a life that is above reproach, that there could never be any question about your character. It'll make your marriage uh, much better, your life much better. The Bible says, honesty lives confident and carefree. And uh, we need to live that way. Uh, you know, Rhonda and I made an agreement a long time ago that uh, we would not, I, I'm not going to ride in a car with a woman who's not my mother, my uh, sister, or my daughter by myself. Uh, it, it's going to be, uh, somebody else is going to have to be in the car. We have a staff integrity, a church staff integrity agreement that we use. That we say, we, I, I will never ride with someone who is not my wife, my mother, my daughter. Uh, by myself and we, we, we talk to each other about this and we protect this and we remind each other of this I will not sit down with them in, in a restaurant somewhere with someone who is not my family with a woman by myself I've seen too much disaster come from that well you know we work together every day yeah and I've seen the disaster that comes from, from that I will not do that you know we have female members of our church staff that uh they need to make a hospital visit. I need to make the same hospital visit. We go find us somebody else to ride with us in the car. Because we're not going to do that. Because you can say, well, you know, but we're, we're innocent. It's no, where we draw the line, where you have to draw the line on, on this honesty thing is avoid the appearance of evil. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Avoid even, the, even the, so, that someone who didn't know you wouldn't have no reason to ever question uh, this part uh, about you. Uh, guard, guard, guard. Number seven, great marriages are holy. Sin in your life will always affect your marriage. And that's true uh, just in, in the rest of life. If you're, if you're doing dishonest things at work, if you're looking at things on your computer, you shouldn't. If you're cheating with your customer, cheating your customers, gossiping, lying, uh, just maybe just not giving God his rightful place in your life. When your spiritual life isn't where it needs to be, it's going to infect your marriage like a virus. So your own personal life needs to be, uh, before God, needs to be right. Peter tells us that conflict and problems in marriage uh, will adversely affect our spiritual life. Verse 7, uh, you need to get this thing right with marriage, he says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. When your marriage isn't the way it's supposed to be, it's going to affect your spiritual life. Sometimes your spiritual life affects your marriage when it's not right. Sometimes, sometimes your spiritual life is affected by the poison that uh, is existing in your married, married life. You know, some, some of you struggling with marriage probably right now, and it's important that you look at both sides of that coin. How's your personal spiritual life? And then how's your marriage? And 
then maybe you can get to the heart of the problem. Uh, the marriage may be where the visible uproar is seen. That's where the sparks are flying visually. Uh, but the problem may be that sin is just residing comfortably in your heart and you're embracing just staying stuck. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, God has bigger things in mind for your marriage. Marriage ought to be an environment where you are happy and fulfilled and, and it should be a place of joy and peace. Uh, but God's, God's vision for, for marriage, Christian marriage, Christian covenant marriage is not just happiness, but it is your personal holiness before him. Number eight, great marriages are peace loving. And uh, sometimes you need, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers in the Sermon on the Mount. Sometimes you, you, need, to, you need to fight forward to establish peace in your marriage relationship. Uh, and sometimes we do everything except that. We actually just enjoy fighting. Uh, a man and his wife were having problems at home. And they decided that the, the best avenue for them going forward was to give each other this silent treat. Which, there's not much that gets better in that environment. And it's just, it's just an just a ugly way to fight. And so they just weren't speaking to each other. That was their solution to things. And... As it went along, uh, for a couple of days, husband realized he had an out-of-town business trip. He was going to have to get up at 5 o'clock to get to the airport on time to make a flight to Chicago. And uh, because of his sleep pattern, uh, a lot of times he just didn't hear his alarm going off. So he needed her to wake him up, but he was not going to break the silence. Because we're just going to play to win, right? And win means I win, not we win, I win. So... He finally came up on the idea. He just, uh, he went to bed first and she was coming to bed later. He just put a, put a note in her pillow and it said, I have an early flight tomorrow. Wake me up 5 a.m. He put it on her pillow. Next morning, he woke up. Sun was shining through the window. He looked at the clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. His flight was already gone. He had missed everything. This is a disaster. He was infuriated. And so he went to just Okay, I'm breaking the silence by tearing into her. And as he stood there thinking of all the terrible things he was about to say to her, he saw on the nightstand there was a note, and it said, 5 a.m., time to wake up. <laughs> you can, this is one that you can fan the flames of conflict. You can just keep stoking the fire over and over and over again when there's conflict. Or you can be the cool, fresh breeze in a marriage. And it's, it's always your choice. You, you can choose one way or the other. But choose, I don't want to challenge you. Choose to be the peacemaker. To be the one who, who makes things better and smoother. And, and somebody has to go first. And uh, you know, I always encourage our men. Man up and you go first. Number nine. Great marriages need God's help. At verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. Peter says uh, <laughs> that, that sweeping the eyes of the Lord, marriage is God's idea, and he wants it to work. This is what I want, God's will, that your marriage be beautiful. That it ref, that, that's God's vision for you, that your marriage reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. So that makes this a big deal. That's God's big vision for you. He wants your marriage to work, but it only works God's way. And uh, in Matthew 19, Jesus was talking about marriage, and he paints that picture for us. Here's how marriage works. It works when there's a man and a woman committed to one another for life under the authority of God. That's when marriage works according to God's plan. That's the structure God says, I will bless. So you ask for God's help. You ask him to bless your spouse, bless your relationship, give you wisdom in that relationship. So here's my challenge when it comes to all things marriage. Just one more shot at marriage before we finish up this series. Just beat the odds on this. My prayer for you is that uh, Paul in Ephesians, you know, my prayer for you is, well, here's my prayer for you in marriage. At whatever stage of marriage, because it can get ugly after decades and decades together too. So don't, don't think you're all, all in the clear now. 
Here's my prayer for you, is that your happiest time in your marriage, the high water mark, when you say, what was the greatest day in your marriage? You won't say, that day when we dressed up and we stood before witnesses, family and friends, and we lit candles and we exchanged, that was the greatest day. I hope that you will never say that. I hope you'd say, you know, I think the greatest day in our marriage is going to be the next one. And today is a special day too. Let's stand and let's pray.